you get your Bible out today, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. We're looking at just a few short verses today in chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. I want to kind of lay the foundation for this message by telling you this, this story of something that happened to me a few years ago, probably about eight or 10 years ago. I had someone reach out to me and say, I, I, want, to, I want to meet up with you. We want to meet up with you. And that's not unusual for me. I get that a lot. You know, I meet with people all the time to talk about their faith, talk about the church. Well, I carved out some time for these people and I sat down with them and they, they told me, um, we're not happy with the preaching at the church. And I looked at them and I said, well, why? <clears throat> why, why are you not happy with the preaching at the church? Well, the answer from these people was very simple. They didn't like the way the sermons made them feel. They wanted to come to church and feel a certain way when they left. Well, I kindly told these people in love that when we commit to preaching to God's word, verse by verse, it unpacks the things that the Lord wants to say to us. And when we do this, when we study things in depth, one of the greatest things it does is it gives us the diagnostics, the diagnosis of all humanity is that we are sinners in need of a savior. See, first of all, the gospel has to be offensive for me to understand that I am a sinner. The problem that is in the church today is this idea that um, the church is about us. And the problem that the church has today is we have catered the efforts of the church to make it about the people, to make it about us, to take our eyes off of our triune God and to make the worship service an experience for you. Where you come in and you say, I just want a motivational speech. Luke, I just want you to, to pat me on the back and make me feel a little bit better about who I am. I, I maybe, yeah, give me a little bit of Jesus, but you know, I really just want to feel better about who I am. See, the call to follow Jesus is so much more than the entertainment-driven church culture that we see. Consumerism-driven worship is not worship at all. It's a counterfeit to the true call of the church to follow Christ. See, people want a Jesus that doesn't cost them anything. They want to come to church and, and be entertained and have their ears tickled and just walk out feeling a little bit better about how good they are. T today we get to see from Jesus what it means to truly follow him, what it means to love him, to serve him, and to understand that following him is not about you. It's about propping up his name and loving him and worshiping him. In our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Gospel of Luke, we find ourselves today in chapter 9, verse 23, and we're going to go down to, to verse 26 today. And what we're going to see are some, some tough tough sayings from Jesus. You want to talk about church growth and making a church grow, don't tell the people the things that Jesus is saying today. Don't confront the church with what it truly costs to follow Christ. Well, if that's what you want, you don't want to hear the truth, then this probably isn't the church for you because we are going to preach the truth. We are going to share the truth and we are going to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Starting saying in verse 23, this is God's word, and this is what it says to us. And he said to all, speaking of Jesus, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. True discipleship is about following, not consuming. It's about Jesus and not about us. The call to the gospel of Jesus Christ is a total abandonment of self. Now I will ask you this question. Does that sound like the main church trend today? Where we have catered the worship service to be an experience for the people. Instead of a time of worshiping God and recognizing his presence. Now this sentence of Jesus is totally different from the self-driven church today. Being a follower of Jesus is anything but easy. 
And it's not based on human feelings, but instead upon biblical truths. Jesus used another analogy one time that you're probably familiar with, saying that there are two gates for all people. The first gate has a wide path, very easy to enter, very easy to travel, and very easy for the world to follow. But this path leads to destruction. It leads to hell. But the other gate, the other path, is very narrow, a very difficult path, but yet it leads to eternal life. Well, the question that's natural is what makes this narrow gate so hard? Here's the simple answer, is it requires self-denial. It requires one to be poor in spirit, meaning those who see their sinful condition and turn to Christ alone. To be a follower of Jesus requires us to turn from self and to turn to Christ. It calls us not only to trust in Christ alone for salvation, but to then live for Christ alone daily. See, repentance is the heart of the gospel message. It's the heart of the message of seeing our sin and hating our sin. Hating self, hating the sinful people that we are and casting our feet at Christ. But also being reminded that this repentance is a gift from God, from the spirit of God when he awakens the dead heart of a sinner by his sovereign grace. I can tell you that the self-denial that Jesus is speaking of here is the total opposite of celebrity pastors, church experiences, and coming to church with a consumerism attitude of saying, what can this church do for me? This is the total opposite of what Christ is calling us to do. Self-denial leads to one taking up their cross daily. To the ones listening that day, they would have understood what Jesus meant. It represented exactly what they thought of when he said it. The horrible death upon a cross that was given as judgment by the Romans to the criminals. This was the most graphic, horrible example that Jesus could have given. If Jesus would have wanted to appeal to the masses, he wouldn't have used this example. And if we wanted to have a mega church this morning, I wouldn't preach this passage and tell you that it's about what Jesus is saying. See, what Jesus is saying is that you are to suffer, that you are going to suffer for his sake. Here's the natural question for all of us today, is what should I expect in my life as a Christian? What should I expect as a teenager when I go back to school and I proclaim my love for Christ and I stand upon the authority of scripture? Same for adults, however old you are today. Here's what you can expect. Hatred, hostility, rejection, persecution, shame. And for some, as even many that were listening that day to Jesus, even death. How does this match up against the consumer-driven entertainment business that we so-call church today? There is no Christian life without a cross. Eternal life is so precious and it is so amazing to those who truly seek it and love Christ. They are willing to give up everything and follow him. True discipleship is costly. We read on to verses 24 and 25. This is God's word. and This is what Jesus says. He says, for whoever would lose, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And then Jesus asks a question, a famous question that many of you know. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What is Jesus saying here? Well, listen to me carefully. This isn't a matter not of kill, literally killing yourself, but of killing self. I'll say it to you again. This isn't a matter of killing yourself, but of killing 
self, to abandon everything for Christ, to put aside the lust of this world, the way of this world, and to follow Christ at all costs. To further illustrate this, Jesus asked the rhetorical question of, what does it profit a man? What good is it for a man if he has everything that this world has to offer? He has all the money, all the fame, all the success, continually pursues the lusts of his flesh. But yet when he dies, he forfeits his soul. That is the greatest question for us to ponder this morning, is what is the direction of my life? What is it that I, that I value? What is it that sits on the throne of my heart this morning? What is it that matters the most to me? Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, is Jesus teaching us that it's, it's wrong to have things, that I shouldn't have stuff? I mean, I have a job, I have a home, I have a car, I have a house. Like, is that what he's teaching us here? Well, the simple answer is, is no. I love how Pastor Vody Bauckham says it. He says, let me clear up something. God is not against you having things. He's against things having you. Maybe you've heard this line before, and I think it's just an important line for us to remember. But as you see the hearse driving to the graveyard with the body of your loved one in the back, have you noticed that there's never a trailer behind the hearse, pulling their things with them as they are about to lay their body in the ground? No, we don't take any of it with us. All that matters is what we do for Christ. All that matters is what we do for God and his kingdom. All that matters is what we do for his church and glorifying him. Our final verse today, if you haven't been a little uncomfortable with this passage this morning, in verse 26, Jesus closes with another staunch and shocking truth when he says this in verse 26. I want you to listen very carefully as I read this. I want to read it slowly. I want it to really absorb into your heart this morning. He says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and of the holy angels. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. True disciples of Jesus deny themselves the pursuits and the empty pleasures that this world tries to offer us. We've been there we've done that. We recognize that the pursuits of this world do not satisfy. Speaking to those in Christ this morning, you look back at the life that you used to live and you say, I am so disgusted by the things that I used to stand for, the things that I used to pursue and love, the things and the way that I used to be, I am disgusted the true disciple of Jesus every single day figuratively takes up their own cross and follows him with no worry of what the world has to say. And in the context of the final thing that Jesus says here today, the true disciple isn't ashamed of their faith and will boldly proclaim the gospel message. They don't reject, despise, or find unacceptable the love that Jesus has shown them. So as we kind of do a, a, a 360 here, kind of back to my original premise of <clears throat> this idea that church is about us. Let me pitch that back to you for just a second. After hearing the words of Jesus today <clears throat> and the things that he says about what it means to follow him and the cost, would you say the church is to be catered for us? 
Would you say today that we are the central focus of the worship service? That it is about entertaining us, making us feel better about ourselves, propping us up. And what I would say to you today is that is the ultimate idol in the church today. And it's self, it's self, that it's all about me. How can we hear the words of Jesus and what he has to say to us and ever come to the conclusion that it's all about us? Of course, we don't come to that conclusion, but I will raise my hand this morning as you should raise your hand as well and say that we are all guilty of this. We are all guilty of walking in and, oh, what's, what's the church gonna do for me? Or, you know, how, how, it's just not about us. But the truth is, is as we unpack God's, God's word verse by verse, and as we, we look at his, his truth, it gives us, of course, the diagnosis that we are sinners, but it doesn't leave us hanging. It doesn't leave us in that situation where we have no way out. And that is where the beauty of the gospel message comes in, is where for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Today, I think we all need to do a little bit of repentance when it comes to our attitudes, when it comes to worship on Sunday mornings. Not only on Sunday mornings, but as Jesus is saying to us here, it's the life that we live for him. It's not being ashamed of who he is and what he has done in our lives. Here in just a moment, we get to see one of the the beautiful ways that we as believers get to proclaim our love for Christ. And, And what a perfect segue as we prepare our hearts here in just a moment to see my daughter follow through in baptism on her birthday. And of course, we don't prop her up. It's not about her but we celebrate the faith that God has awakened in her heart by his grace, by hearing the gospel from this church, from Emily, from Jacob, to Jerry, to Dan, to to Malachi. I mean, I could name everybody's name in here that have poured into my daughter and my kids. And again, we're not propping ourselves up. We are looking at the evidence of God's work You want to see God's work? You want to see God's hand at work? Look at what he's doing in a church that loves his word. And today I I celebrate with you the, the work of salvation that is all of God. I give God the glory for capturing my daughter's heart, for capturing many of your hearts today of, of recognizing that you are a sinner and that Jesus is that only savior. And I pray as you go about your life this week, as you go about your job, as you go to your school, these words from Jesus echo in your mind about being unashamed of who he is. I mean, can you imagine me bringing my daughter up here this morning and and being ashamed of her, being ashamed of my wife, being ashamed of my son, being ashamed of, of my church family, of my family? And so many times in our lives, we have opportunities to share the good news of the gospel with others, to to share the good news of, of Jesus with others, and we're ashamed. I pray that God would give us the strength as we go about our, our jobs, our, our, our families, our schools, and that we would live our lives bold and unashamed. You want to pray a, a dangerous prayer this morning? Pray a prayer of God, bring somebody in my path this week that I can share your truth with. That's a dangerous prayer because I guarantee that he will answer it. I guarantee that he will give you an opportunity this week to stand upon his truth, to stand upon his love, to stand upon his mercy and to share that truth with someone. I do wanna go back and I wanna read this passage 
as a whole to you, starting with verse 23 as we close today. It says, and he said to all, if any would, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24 and 25, for whosoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And then lastly today, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and of the holy angels.